Okay. Good morning, students of the Word. Uh, I think Noah's going to be pulling up here for too long on the in the ark. Not sure. I see a dove out there. I want to start by reading a passage that uh, David said in uh, 1 Chronicles 29. David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. We are continuing to discuss the spiritual gift of knowledge. Last week we started talking about uh, examples of life situations in which it might be hard to see God working through those situations to make us more like his son. We read, we read uh, 1 Peter 2. Peter there is talking about, in uh, 1 Peter 2, um, I think it's chapter 1, yes where Peter is talking about slaves and how converted slaves should act and how to view suffering for them and for us. Is suffering a part of life? Yeah, even for the best, even for the healthiest even for the most faithful. Then he posted something that uh, is so true. In life, pain is inevitable. Misery is optional. God can use hard times <coughs> to strengthen our faith. And that's when we find out what we're made of what our understanding of God is and what God does for us. We discussed how the Spirit can use this gift of, the spiritual gift of knowledge to build up the body and how this is an ongoing work on the part of the Spirit and on our part in yielding to the Spirit. Several weeks ago, I keep bringing this up, but several weeks ago, Alan mentioned about studying. That's, a, that's effort. That takes time. It takes diligence. It takes concentration. It takes effort to gain knowledge. And there's no point at which a Christian, no matter his or her physical calendar age, can dust off their hands and say, okay, I'm done. I've done my part. I'm just going to sit in my rocking chair and wait until I meet the Lord. Paul said, I've fought a good fight. Well, you can say that, but you're still in the fight, aren't you? You're still in the race, aren't you? And so am I. Even so, gaining knowledge is not an accomplished task. There is no end in sight, except what we're hoping for, what we're looking for. But it's rather an ongoing work. It's a rather an ongoing endeavor. And we also talked about how um, there is one faith, but there are different levels of that individual faith, depending upon maturity and the measure given by the Spirit. The same is true for knowledge. There is one knowledge, but different levels of individual knowledge, depending on my efforts and desire, and the measure granted by the Spirit. I think it was Mark that commented last week, though, that the more one searches for knowledge of Jesus, 
the more the Spirit will reveal to us. We looked at one of my favorite passages from 2 Peter 1, verse 3. Jesus has the power of God by which he has given us everything we need to live and to serve God. 1 Peter, uh, sorry, 2 Peter, 2 Peter 1, 3. He has given us everything we need to live and to serve God because Jesus has the power of God. We have these things because we know him. I love that. We have these things because we know him. Jesus called us by his glory and goodness. Later in that same chapter of 2 Peter 1, Peter calls upon all believers to continue growing so that they can be useful and productive in this knowing of Christ, in this knowledge they've gained about Christ. And again, it's a continuing process. It's an ongoing process. It's a, as long as we are able to learn, live and breathe and see, and even if we can't see, the blind can learn, can't they? The deaf can learn. We can learn as long as we've got our faculties. And Peter says, keep growing, keep learning, keep adding. Now, for the dark side, dark aspects, the dark side of this gift. Can you think of some things that might be some dark sides of the spiritual gift of knowledge. If you abuse it. Well, we'll talk about that, yes. We already looked, number one, we already looked at um, the teachers of the law in Luke 11. Jesus is talking about the Pharisees and he's He's excoriating them, and um, one of the lawyers, one of the teachers of the law, says, well, yeah, you're insulting us too. And recall that Jesus responded, how terrible for you, you experts on the law. Some translations say you lawyers, some say you teachers of the law. You have taken to the way the key to learning, this is our word gnosis, our word knowledge, You've taken away the key to knowledge about God. You yourselves would not learn or gain knowledge. And you stopped others from learning too. So these lawyers, we talk about understanding in, in the context of this verse. These lawyers lacked understanding as we talked about it, right? They had no desire to continue learning. No desire to see the obvious that was right in front of them. And so they prevented others. Don't pay any attention to that Galilean. He doesn't know what he's talking about. They, they discounted his miracles. The right heart to listen is critical. And see what God is trying to reveal through scripture. And really... One with the spiritual gift of knowledge already has understanding. So this would be a stumbling block, uh, would be, it would, wouldn't necessarily be a dark side of the gift, but something to be, to guard against that oh, I've got it now. And anybody that says, well, there's another part to learn, I'm going to discount them. They, they don't know what they're talking about because I know what this means. I've got the knowledge. Already, I know I have this spiritual gift, and so I obviously have these answers. Something to guard against. A prideful stumbling block to guard against. Any thoughts about that before we go to the next one? Number two, stumbling blocks or dark sides. Because... Of the deep, and this goes along with what we just said. Because of the deeper knowledge that one has, 
she or he might forget to consider the effects of that knowledge-based action as viewed through one who lack viewed through the eyes of someone who lacks that same knowledge, that same depth of knowledge. Remember, Paul talks about the freedom that we have in Christ. And he talks about just such a situation where one has knowledge but forgets to be mindful that those who don't have that same level of understanding, that same level of knowledge, might see what I am doing. In 1 Corinthians 8, Paul says, Be careful that your freedom does not cause those who are weak in faith to fall into sin. <clears throat> Bill, do you have that one? That uh, 1 Corinthians 8? 9, 10, 11. And Donnie, I'm going to have you, if you would, uh, prepare to read 1 Corinthians, uh, some verses out of 13, 1 Corinthians 13, when we get there. What chapter 8? Thir 1 Corinthians 13 will be where we'll be reading in a while. This is 1 Corinthians 8, mm -hmm. 9, 10, and 11. Take care that this liberty does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you who has knowledge, I, am I a tempt for his conscience if he is weak? Be strengthened to keep them back from God. Yeah? For though your knowledge, for through your knowledge, he who is weak is unified. Okay, so this is a situation, I know, as Peter did, that the sheet came down three times, and that all these things are okay. The idols mean nothing to me, because I'm a worshiper of God, I have never worshipped idols, and so the Jew could say, I don't have any problem eating that meat. What difference does it make where it was burned? Or whether it was burned in front of a fireplace or burned in front of an idol. I don't care. And Paul says, that's true. But, what if you've got someone that has been an idol worshiper and has turned away from that and they see you eating that meat? Paul says, are you, gonna, are you going to use your knowledge, your superior knowledge, and just disregard how that other brother or sister might feel about that? Okay, read uh, 12 and 13 now, Bill, please. And, and so by sinning against your brother and wondering, wouldn't it? So the knowledge has caused the user of the knowledge to overlook, to not be sensitive or be less sensitive to those who lack the knowledge. And Paul gives an example. There are many others. But this was a big problem in the first century church. The former idol worshippers, we might say, were in some ways like the alcoholic who has gotten away from his or her drink. The Bible condemns alcoholism, but if you read the text carefully, Paul even talks to Timothy about using a little alcohol. 
a little wine for your stomach. It might help you, Timothy. I don't know what his stomach problem was, but if it was reflux, that's going to make it worse, Paul. <laughs> While Jews might eat meat offered to idols, it could cause a Gentile who was a former idol worshiper to stumble. And think about this. I've been used to having my bacon and my sausage. And the Jews are coming and they're, they're, they're worshiping with us. And so for the basket dinner, I'm going to bring bacon and eggs. Well, the Jews might be offended, the Jewish brethren. Even though Peter has said they, he saw this vision, ah, I still can't. I don't, boy, I just. Brothers, I can't believe he's eating that. You see how that goes? Even though something might be okay by the freedom that we have in Christ, the knowledge that we have of that should also open our eyes to who else is around and what is their level of understanding. What is their level of no. We've, we've encountered this some um, in when missionaries go to foreign countries in the worship the, that they do and how they do their worship. In dressing, um, when we first started going to Ecuador back in the early 2000s, if women went out and to eat that sort of thing, they didn't wear pants. No, 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 no. It was always a skirt or a dress. And the same thing in El Salvador, when we used to go down there. Women in worship never used to wear pants. And think about in the 50s here. Did you ever see a woman in pants? Did you ever see a man without a tie or a jacket? Is there something wrong with that? No. But if we were in the 50s, and I walked up like this, and everyone was expecting me to wear a tie, and it distracted them from worship. I might be offending someone, and for what? Because I don't want to have a piece of cloth around my neck? You see where that is? Bill. Can I open the door to the people? Yes. Um, and so possibly this gift of knowledge of the dark side could cause the one with the gift to feel superior. That's so stupid. I mean, even if it's not said, it might be the attitude. So that he or she is going to go ahead even though someone might find offense by what Christians have a right, quote unquote, to do under their freedom in Christ. They lose sight, this person does, loses sight of the goal of love. The goal of what the Spirit is trying to do through that knowledge, and that is to bring the body together. And Paul says in the scripture that Bill just read, it's better to be a vegetarian. To not eat meat for the rest of your life. To give up bacon. <sighs> <laughs> than to offend a fellow believer. If your Jewish brethren are offended because you want to eat that good Duroc side meat or pork ribs barbecue. Better not to do it. <clears throat> Cook some kale. <laughs> Paul addresses this um, idea about offending others in 1 Corinthians. 13, doesn't he? Donnie, if you would read 
verses 2, for now, verse 2. If I have the gift of prophecy, and all, and know all mysteries, and all knowledge, and if I have faith, so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. So, notice how the new century says this. The secret things of God, the mysteries of God, and how those are so difficult to understand. And that is one of the reasons for this gift of knowledge, to help uncover these unseen things that cannot be explained by human intelligence, cannot be explained by human reasoning. And I have all knowledge. All. I mean, I'm as wise as God. Paul says, it doesn't matter if you've forgotten what the Spirit is supposed to be trying to accomplish through your gift. If I don't have love, In today's church, um, we could think of maybe some things that uh, have caused controversy in the past. They don't in our group. But uh, one cup. What if, what if, granted, as Bill said, there's, there's a teaching moment here. If someone is hung up on that one cup. But if if we go to meet with someone in a place where we're vacationing and they have one cup, are we going to say, no, 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 no. You need to split this up. I'll want to pour some in this cup for me. We, we wouldn't do that, would we? Number one, because we're a guest. Number two, because that is not in the spirit of love. We might say the same thing about uh, wearing a covering on the head for women, or uh, a man not a man covering his head. And you know the, that passage that's one place in the New Testament talks about. And it's difficult to read. I mean, you can go back and you see different translations. We don't have any such custom, or there is no other such custom in the church. Or, I mean, it's difficult to read. And if it gets in the way here, if I don't have love, I'm nothing. Are we going to start making a big issue out of that? Um What does verse 3 say? Verse 3 says, If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Yep, yep. Does yours say it any differently, Donnie? It says pretty much, If I have all possessions and feed the poor, if I surrender my body to be burned, and do not have love, it profits me nothing. Yeah. Um, you remember when Christ was talking about those who would come and say, Lord, Lord, haven't we done all this in your name? Haven't we? I don't know you. I never knew you. Right. First John 4, 7 and 8. Love one another. God is love. You don't love one another. You don't know God. I never knew you. Does that all make sense? Christ's freedom may allow many things, but does going ahead and doing so in the face of someone who might be offended, who is a brother or sister, does that cause offense? If so, 
The knowledge received as a spiritual gift becomes a divider of the body rather than building up and uniting. It's profitless. Nothing. And you could even be burned at the stake if you don't have that love. That's a tough, tough thing. But I gave it all. But it's really not. I mean, it's easy to love, isn't it? Some people aren't. Hey, why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> You're easy to love, Mark. Just we we talked to Debbie about that. <laughs> All right. Any more thoughts on that? The, the best is that to know what we can learn to develop that love. And it's not just a spontaneous thing. Mm -hmm. We can learn that and grow <coughs> that and develop more and more over time. The people that And as John says, if it wasn't done because of love, if they didn't do, if they didn't love their brother, they didn't know God. So, yeah. That is the heart of John. It is. You know, uh, Don, Don Francisco has this song, Love is Not a Feeling, It's an Act of the Will. I don't know if any of you have heard that. Look it up on YouTube. I sang that at our wedding. To my right. Because it starts out, I could never promise you on just my strength alone. And then it goes on from that. And talks about love is not a feeling, it is an act of the will. I didn't, did I cut you off? Uh, I'm just saying, I'm, who you are is part of the change that we have to do. There's a lot of things where we can be one way to try to make it, and try to get things right. Mm -hmm. That's really what we were dealing with. Doing the thing, but the motive, what, why they were doing it, is something that you have to look at. Yeah. And if you're trying to, are you just trying to have everlasting life, or are you trying to have a relationship with God? Well, in the First Corinthians, the the Corinthian church was an example of that, where they they met to break bread together. But that was it wasn't to commemorate to remember Christ. It was to eat and run. Check the box, and well, if you don't, if you didn't bring anything, sorry, but you know this is our food. Do any of you remember hearing, other than second hand or third hand, hearing someone say back in the day, I, I, I don't have a suit, I, I can't go to worship, I, I just don't have the clothes. Or I don't have a tie, or I don't have this, I, pre, I, I don't, I don't look. And what did Isaiah say about Christ? He's not going to be a real person. No. In fact, we're going to look at him and say, whoa, God must hate him. Yeah. 
Jesus said, I didn't come to help the well. I came to seek the sick. And if we don't recognize our sickness, then that's a whole other problem. So, number three, just as we looked at with wisdom, one may become prideful, as Sister Linda mentioned, in his or her level of knowledge, and not only look down on others, lacking the same level, but, as I alluded to earlier, be jealous of anyone who comes along and challenges that knowledge or says something that might be different from what I have promoted as, well, this is the meaning of that, or this is what we should get from that scripture or that passage. Uh, we read in James 3, you remember back when we were studying about wisdom a couple of years back? No. Uh, back in James 3 about wisdom and selfishness with one's wisdom. And the same <clears throat> can occur with knowledge. James says this selfishness and this, this uh, pride can cause problems in the church because, again, forgot the whole purpose that the Spirit gave the gift to bring the church together, to build the church up. <clears throat> and this, this can even lead to useless arguments. You ever sat in a class where there were useless arguments going on? Not in the church, of course. But. And Paul warns Timothy about this. <clears throat> I'm go over to 1 Timothy 6. And Don, I'm going to have you do some more reading there. Um, let me get over here. Let's get out of that. In 1 Timothy 6, in the first few verses there, you can read that and infer, because Paul's talking about all who are slaves should do respect to their masters, and this is kind of like what Peter was talking about, isn't it? Um, so no one will speak against God's name, and he talks about the slaves who have believing masters, and... <clears throat> So we can infer from these first few verses in Timothy 6 that some individuals had been teaching that converted slaves should be treated differently than non-converted slaves. Maybe they shouldn't have to work as hard. Maybe they should not, maybe they should have increased status in the household. Maybe, maybe they should uh, get preferential treatment. That'd make a great recruiting theme for Christianity, wouldn't it? If you become a Christian, especially if you have a Christian master, they're going to have to treat you better. Paul refutes that teaching. It's interesting, Paul doesn't talk about the evils of slavery, but he talks about serving with the right attitude in slavery. Serving the Lord in whatever physical station one finds herself, one finds himself. Don, you want to read uh, 6 1 through 2, please? All who are under the yoke as slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and our doctrine will. Those who have believers, those who have believers as their masters, must not disrespect them because they are brethren, but must serve them all the more because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved. Teach and preach these principles. Yeah, help 
accepting beloved brothers in slavery through their service. We don't hear much of that these days. One does not. And you'll notice a parallel by what we were just talking about in the church, being mindful of how others are going to view your use of your knowledge, your use of your freedom in Christ, and being mindful that it doesn't cause someone to stumble. Same idea here, except here you're looking at the world. He says, you don't want to bring disgrace on the gospel. You don't want to bring disgrace on the word of God. You don't want to give the world a reason to say, those Christians, I mean, they're just turning the world upside down. Oh, they didn't say that, didn't they? But you don't want to give them a reason other than the real reason, Jesus Christ. Um, that wouldn't, as you said, Mark, be a popular text today among those whose ancestors were slaves, no matter the color of their skin, because there were the Irish were slaves in Europe long before there were slaves in the United States or contemporary slaves. But Paul talks about those who would say things different than what he was teaching. And he says, they are sick with the love for arguing. Read verse 4, please, Don. He is conceited and understands nothing. He has a morbid interest in controversy, conversational questions. Other words, out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, and evil suspicions. Does it say anything about have uh, causing have lost the truth in four, five, or three, three, four, five, somewhere in there? And uh, concentration between men of deprived minds and deprived and depravity of the truth, yes. who suppose that godliness is a means. Depravity of the truth or have lost the truth. Now, if the spirit is truth, we read that passage. If the spirit is truth, that means they no longer have the spirit. So they don't have the knowledge that only the spirit can give this person. If they get focused, again, this is kind of what we might say going off the rails. They are going down this side passage, this rabbit trail, and getting caught up about arguing about words and quarreling and discuss, we're just discussing, no you're not, you're arguing and you've lost the love that is to bring the body together because you're so prideful that, or I'm so prideful that I'm convinced that my way is right and I've got to prove you wrong. Ever been there? It's almost as if you're looking for something. My mom used to say, you should be a lawyer. You love to argue. That was when I was young and foolish. I'm no longer young. <laughs> yes, they love to argue. And so they've lost the spirit. They've lost the truth because they're focused on things that divide rather than the spirit of truth that brings together and unifies. Christ prayed in the garden, I want them to be one, Father, as you and I are one. There's no division there. 
Paul cautions Timothy about them and about others who are focused on this world, focused on things of this world, rather than focusing on pleasing God and holding on to the spirit of truth. Drop down, Donnie, now to verse 20 and 21, please. O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some, which some have professed and thus gone astray. Off the rail. Not even going in the right direction now. And so this is a dark side of the, the gift, the spiritual gift of knowledge or knowledge that any Christian might have is losing sight of I can have all knowledge. I can have all knowledge. What God knows. And if I don't have love, Don't go off the rails, Paul says. And then he goes ahead, he gives a number of warnings about things that could distract a Christian from the spirit of truth. Uh, back up, I think, in verses 10 and 11, 9, 10, 11. Um, and he says, in verse 11, don't do those things. Live the right way. Live the right way. Would Paul know anything about arguing about techno, technical points of religion or of the law or something falsely called knowledge? Would Paul know anything about that? What was the training of a Pharisee? You sat around and you discussed these minutiae law and different opinions and that this... Hillel thought this way, and this writer thought that way, and who was right, and who was wrong, and why they were... That's what you did. That was part of your training. And it's interesting that Jewish brethren... My dad commented about this when he was going over to Israel uh, and doing tours over there. Oftentimes you're sitting in class, and it's almost as if people are almost yelling at each other, and he says, they're not... If it were in our society, it would be acrimonious. But in their society, that's what—that's the way they interact. <laughs> and and you know, so you have to again take those things into account um, when they discuss something over there. Sometimes it becomes quite what we would say. Oh, that's real heated. And we wouldn't feel comfortable. Dad said he was a little uncomfortable. But then afterwards, he saw these two brothers go up and laugh and hug each other. And so, you know, different cultures. But Paul would know. Paul would know. And he realized, you, we don't want to drag that into the church. That is not something, Timothy, that we want in the body of Christ. It may have been okay in the synagogue. Not in the body of Christ. If you don't have love and it's not demonstrated, as James says, it's worth nothing. All right, we will stop there and continue next uh, week. I appreciate your reading, your comments. God bless. <laughs>